Chapter 4 The Lady Irene Irene glanced over the newest recruits. She couldn't help but remember what it was like her first time to Dragon Mount. She had been scared and nervous as well. Nobody spoke as they passed through the guarded stone archway. Once they were through the gate, Irene lagged behind. She watched Cora and Solston lead the way up the winding stairs to Dragon Mount. Warren turned and glanced down. Are you all right, little sister? he asked. Irene smiled. Yes, I'm just tired, she assured him. Warren gave a sympathetic nod. Me too. It's a lot quieter without Nora around, he sighed. Irene grimaced. Well, she wouldn't wish what happened to Nora on anybody, but she secretly was a bit glad that she was gone. Irene had always been at odds with Nora. That woman was a tyrant, and she made sure everyone knew that she was a proper mage and that she was in charge. If it was at all possible, she was worse than Cora. At least Cora could actually be nice sometimes, but only when you weren't expecting it. What really bothered Irene was the fear that was on everyone's mind. That very same feral bull drake that had attacked Nora and mauled poor Golden and Eyes was still out there. Male dragons were extremely territorial, and the chances of running into it again were very high. Irene couldn't stand the thought of losing Melody. The very thought of losing her dragon made her want to wretch. Well, Irene hated Nora. She pitied her as well. Her only two friends were her dragon and her sword companion. Irene didn't know why Nora liked him so much. He hated flying and was so rude and bullheaded. Now come to think of it, perhaps they were the perfect couple after all. Warren spoke again. How's Melody doing? he asked conversationally. Irene blinked as she regained her focus. She is well, for now, considering everything and being cooped up and all, she assured him. We are lucky to have you as our dragon soother. Irene smiled over toward Warren. And I'm glad for your maps. I would be lost without them. <laughs> Nonsense. The dragons always know how to get back home. It's the infantry and navy that get lost all the time, Warren chuckled and leaned over to whisper. Well, I take that back. Cora has always been a bit directionally impaired. Irene flashed Warren in an impish grin. She knew he was alluding to the little prank when they had swapped out Cora and Nora's maps and compasses. Supposedly, they wound up all the way in the Gojin Marsh, where Nora had found Vila, or rather, Vila had found them. The little trick might have been considered a success if they didn't have to listen to Nora complain about Vila for months straight and then pine away, wondering if he would ever come to her. He did, of course. And Irene didn't know why. The man was a big lummox, and she wasn't jealous, because there wasn't anything to be jealous about. Irene quickly pushed Vila out of her mind, and quickly changed topics. What do you think of our new recruits, she asked. Yes, well, they come and they go, I suppose. 
I don't get too attached to anybody or start mentoring anyone until a year or so, he advised. Irene nodded. It was good advice. Then again, if Cora wasn't so cruel, people might actually want to stick around. Irene shuddered. Some of the recruits had even taken their own lives. But this still wasn't enough to get her to tone things down. If anything, Cora had ramped things up a notch to make up for Nora's absence. While she had enjoyed the chat with Warren, she quickly came to regret that she had lingered so far behind everyone, as now she had no idea who to give the books back to. With their bald heads and great clothes, it was difficult to tell them apart. This, of course, was intentional. It was rare for recruits to be remembered or called out by name. That was unless something bad happened or if they were being singled out for punishment. Nora took in a calming breath and channeled her inner Nora rage monster. With a graceful and calm, determined poise, she strode into the dormitories. At once... The recruits who weren't working quickly got busy. While she didn't exactly know any of their names, she could tell by their body language and how personalized their cramped little rooms were that they had been around for a while. Irene couldn't help but feel a bit awkward about ordering young men and women about that at times were older than she was. It didn't help that she was short well, not that short. Everyone was short when standing next to Nora or Simmons. Simmons was so tall, she actually felt a little bad for him. Magi Solston gave Irene a concerned look. I was beginning to worry about you. Are you doing all right? he asked. I'm fine. I'm just uh, doing some inspections, she announced and gave the recruits a stern glare. How long do you think you can pretend to clean that same blasted doorknob? She demanded. The recruit gulped and quickly scurried off. Cora smiled and gave Irene a nod of approval. You're getting the hang of it, she praised her. Irene forced herself to match the old hag's devious tight-lipped grin. It's a rather satisfying, isn't it? She remarked. If it was at all possible, Cora's grin got bigger, and her eyes sparkled all the more fiercely. Would you like me to help? she asked. Irene pursed her lips thoughtfully. How about I start at the top and get some practice first, and you can start at the bottom, and then we'll meet in the middle, she suggested. That sounds like an excellent idea. It will give the rest of the cockroaches less time to coordinate and hide contraband. Cora concurred. Irene forced herself to smile. She hated being cruel, but she knew why it had to be. Dragon Hall was not for civilians. Thankfully, dragons only needed to eat once a month, but it didn't stop their prey drive. This could be somewhat controlled through a soul bond, but not always. The soul bond merely allowed the dragon master to compel a dragon to return and to be aware what the dragon was thinking and feeling at the moment. However, that moment could quickly change in the blink of an eye. Staying focused, Irene proceeded on her way. The new recruits had just received their blankets and bedding. The only problem was, Irene just couldn't tell who was who. Books were expensive, and she couldn't get caught asking a line of recruits to describe their books to her. With calm, poised determination, she passed by each room. At the end of the hall, she found what she was looking for. The bald-headed recruit sat glumly, by herself on the edge of her little cot. I see you have a room all to yourself, Irene remarked. 
The recruit did not raise her head. She seemed a little disappointed. Irene quickly recognized Magi Solson's book on the nightstand, and as discreetly as she could, she walked over and slid her fingers along the, the writing desk at the center of the room. You'll get used to it. Recruits come and go, Irene assured her. May shook her head. It's not that. I forgot my books. And Magi Cora said, If I left to get them, I wouldn't ever be allowed back into Dragon Hall again, she sniffed. Keeping the books hidden, Irene turned and glanced down at the bald-headed young woman in surprise. How did you know Cora was a mage? Irene asked. May glanced up wordly. Well, she was in Master Warren's book, but I forgot it, she explained. Irene quirked a curious brow. Am I in his book as well? she asked curiously. Yes, Master Irene, she replied meekly. He spoke very highly of you and said you were very nice, but you like keeping to yourself and your dragon. Irene fought the urge to turn around and begin gleaning through the book for her name. And, uh, what did he say about Nora? She pried curiously. The young girl's sapphire blue eyes went big with panic. I haven't read it all, she said quickly. Good answer, Irene responded coldly. She glided her finger across the desk and let out a scathing tisk. Oh, your room is filthy. If I find this again, you'll be have five lashings. Do you understand? She snapped at her. Do you understand? Irene repeated louder this time. But she was completely taken off guard as the bald-headed recruit leapt off the bed and embraced her with a big, warm hug. Irene flannered about. She wasn't sure what to do. This was not supposed to happen. She could feel the genuine gratitude and warmth radiating from the girl. Erin quickly shoved May's hands down and forced her to stand at a distance and reprimand the starry-eyed recruit. Don't ever do that again! If anybody asks, you found those books in your pack. This is not a fun camp or a dragon petting zoo, and I am not your friend, Irene insisted sternly. May beamed up at her and quickly nodded her head. Irene quickly dusted off her tunic and braced her hands on her hips and gave May another stern glare. I meant what I said about the lashings, Irene warned. May bowed her head. I know, Cora told me that too, she sighed and bit her lip. Is she really that mean, she asked wordly. Worse, especially now. Irene warned. But, but why? She gasped in shock. Irene sighed. The first thing you need to know about Cora is she doesn't like anybody, and she is especially cruel to the people that she does like, she warned. That must be really hard for you, May whispered. Irene hesitated. Again, the recruit had taken her off guard. What else is in that silly book, she demanded. Nothing, May said quickly. Irene grimaced and glanced around. Do you have any other questions before I go, she asked. What did your parents think about you becoming a dragon rider, May asked hesitantly. I didn't ask, so I don't know, she shrugged. May bit her lower lip. May I ask another question, Master Irene, she ventured. Irene gave a nod. Could I see Melody? No! You just got here! Don't get any ideas of trying to sneak in there. If I took you in, you'd be torn limb from limb. And you wouldn't be the first L Molly to do so, she snapped at her. May lowered her head. She wasn't sure who Molly was, but she was scared to ask. Instead, she fished out a tangerine-sized blue glass b ball from her pocket and handed the dragon charm over to Irene. I heard she likes the color blue. Irene hesitated. Yes, she does fancy blue, she agreed, and her eyes narrowed 
the suspicious sideways slits. Do you have any more? Or do I have to call Cora in and shake you up and down? Irene asked coldly. May gulped and quickly handed over the hidden pouches under her baggy gray shirt. And each pouch was a dragon charm. These weren't magic, but dragons liked shiny objects. And they saw a glass ball just as valuable as any gem. And since they only needed to feed once a month, they often found treasure far more appealing than even food. Irene wasn't sure whether to be angry or impressed. You carried all of those up here? Where did you get this? she demanded. I made the belt and pouches and bought the charms, May mumbled. Irene grimaced. Your new name is Trouble. May bit her lower lip wordily. I didn't know I wasn't allowed to bring them. Nobody said I couldn't, she began. You didn't ask either, Irene snapped, but then closed her eyes. She remembered what she had said only moments ago. May dropped her gaze. Please don't send me away, she begged. Irene grit her teeth as she wagged her finger, but she was at a loss for words. Finally, she gave up and placed a stern hand on May's shoulder and gazed deep into her big, frightened blue eyes and spoke in a low, stern voice. Stay away from the stables and don't get yourself killed or do anything stupid and you might actually live to be a dragon rider one day, she advised and pivoted back around and stormed out of the dormitories. But on her way through the dining hall, she spotted Torn. Master Torn was a big black mountain of silence. He sat at the table alone with a big mug of hard drink in his mangled hands. Torn was not a mage or an artist. He was a battle-scarred veteran, and through pure grit and determination, he had gotten into Dragon Hall the hard way. Irene frowned as he glanced down at the sword on his belt and the large crossbow next to him. Well, it was not uncommon for Torin to carry a sword everywhere he went. Well, he probably even slept with it. It was a bit overboard to go roaming around a mountain fortress with a loaded crossbow in the dining hall. Still... The more anybody had tried to convince him that it wasn't necessary, the more tightly he clung to it. Irene slowed down. The tension in the air was so thick she could cut it with a knife and scrape it on toast. He was scared. Everybody was scared. And everyone was handling it badly. Irene couldn't help but wonder what things would be like if... Old man Don Ruskell was around. She wondered what he would do. Irene bit her lip and quietly sat down across from Torin. She made up her mind that she wouldn't scold him like Magi Cora or try to reason with him like Magi Solston. Instead, she would be his friend. Is there anything I can do to help? Irene inquired. Torin slid his heavy wooden mug across the table. Irene felt her face go red with anger and embarrassment. He didn't even smile or make eye contact with her. He just held up his empty mug like she was some kind of tavern maid. I was trying to be nice. Nora snapped at him and slammed the door behind her. Once she was in her private quarters... Irene tossed the dragon charms onto her large canopy green bed and glanced out the small stone circular window frame. Her face was flushed red with tears. She felt so trapped and alone. She couldn't talk to the recruits, and her peers looked down at her. Warren at least was pleasant, but he still saw her as a child. Irene wiped her tears and went over to light a stick of incense and closed her eyes. 
Sprigga, guide me, she pleaded. Sprigga was the goddess of spring, wisdom, and new beginnings. Over as much as she tried to meditate on the holy scriptures, her mind kept drifting back toward Torn. She remembered yelling at him. That had not been right. She had only been nice for selfish reasons. She hadn't been nice at all. In fact, she hadn't been downright horrible. Taking a deep breath, Nora grit her teeth and turned back around. She was going to make things right, and she wasn't going to turn into a bitter, shriveled-up old prude like Cora. However, the dining hall was empty. Irene sighed. She already knew where Torrin was. On the very top peak of Dragon Mount was the watchtower. In that little, cold, cramped room was a small shrine dedicated to Master Don Ruskell. While the shrine was dedicated to their beloved dead mentor, it was Torrin who haunted that tower. This was Torrin's place of solitude and contemplation. Irene had tried to come visit him several times before. He never spoke to her. His silence was so deafening and oppressive, Irene couldn't even bear to stay in the same room with him for more than a few minutes. Even if she was playing her harp, Torn's gloomy silence drowned her out. But that wouldn't happen today. As she approached the base of the ladder, Irene smiled, imagining the look on his face when she came up through the hatch with a plate full of cookies and a mug of hard drink. A big black boot pressed firmly down on the hatch. Who goes there? Torn growled. Irene gasped in frustration. It's me! Password! Torn demanded. Irene rolled her eyes. I brought hard drink and cookies, she announced. And the boots slid off the wooden hatch. But when Irene poked her head out, she was not greeted with Torn's smiley face. Instead, she stared up at the bent arms of his loaded crossbow. Torn glanced behind her suspiciously. Without a hint of remorse or apology for scaring her, Torn turned and picked up his spyglass and found something interesting to look at. You could have shot me, Irene protested. Torn lowered his spyglass and frowned, a deep frown, and gave her the look. That look was sufficient for all occasions and answered all of life's possible questions with no, now go away. Irene wanted to throw something at him, but she reminded herself why she had come in the first place. I'm sorry I yelled at you in the dining hall. She apologized and held up the large mug of hard drink to him. Torrin said nothing and turned back toward his spyglass. Irene sighed and quietly set the mug down on the wooden stool beside him and returned with a plate full of cookies with bright, frosted smiles. I brought you cookies as well, she declared as she pushed the tray into his arms. Haunted, dark, mahogany brown eyes glanced down at the happy faces. Torrin offered them back. I made them all for you. Oh. Her voice trailed off as Torrin took the plate and dumped all of the cookies out the window. Irene's mouth dropped open and she stared up at the large, thankless beast before her. Oh, oh, why did you do that? she gasped. I don't like cookies, Torn grunted, and handed her back the empty plate. Irene quietly turned away, hiding her face so that he would not see her quivering bottom lip. And when she realized that the thank you or apology would not come, she climbed back down the ladder 
and walked over to the nearby window to regain her composure. She flinched as the metal plate bounced off the windowsill. Irene swallowed hard as she watched the plate continue its flight down the steep granite cliff face and then went on her way. Everyone had their secret place. Torn's was the lookout tower, but Irene had one even better. It had been years since she had been there last. Normally she could just take Melody and fly away and be by herself, but right now was different. She had found this secret place when she was a recruit. It had been the only place she could go to be alone, the only place nobody would find her or scream or be upset with her. When no one was looking, Irene slung her travel harp over her shoulder. When nobody was looking, Irene slung her travel harp over her shoulder and quietly deviated from the path. She flattened herself up against the rough, uncut, natural granite mountain wall, began inching her way around the narrow shelf. One misstep and she would plummet hundreds of feet to her death. However, Irene was a dragon rider. She was no stranger to heights, and she had looked death in the face every day. Once she was around the bend, she smiled as she came to a comfortable, spacious little nook. The smooth, moss-covered sitting rock called to her. She knew this place by heart. Every rock, every stone, like the back of her hand. It was exactly the way Irene paused, and she frowned when she spotted the little wood shavings at her feet. Somebody else had been here. Irene didn't know why, but she felt angry and violated. She turned and quickly spotted the loose rocks and pulled them away. Inside the stone seam, she discovered a wooden box. She pulled it out. She hoped she would find contraband of some kind, so she could find an excuse to be rid of the trespassers. But what she found were drawings. Beautiful, breathtaking drawings of birds, and of Glendon City, and of the little flowers that grew in the cracks of rocks, and of course, dragons. So many dragons. Irene bit her lip as she closed the little wooden box shut. Whoever had come here came often, and she could tell by the sooty fingerprints whoever it was most likely worked in the fire pits nearby. That meant they would be back soon. It was what she would have done, after all, when she was a recruit. With a poised, secret smile, Irene put the rocks over the, the stone seam and quietly climbed up a little further until she found a nice little perch where she could observe from a distance without being seen. Time passed, but Irene was patient. From where she sat, she had the perfect view of the bright green ocean right in front of her. Over to the east, she could see the sun shining down on the bright orange shingled rooftops. The local deep red clay was so abundant and plentiful. At first glance, it seemed like everyone in Glendon had the same gentle sloping bright orange tile roof. Over a variety of soft, creamy beige pastel brick structures, there were a few exceptions, of course. A few of the large mansions of wealthy merchants and government officials had chosen copper plating instead, which had now aged into a lime green patina in the sun. Irene turned away and fixed her gaze onto the horizon. Her long, braided, thick black hair rested over her shoulder. She had found this little secret place many years ago when she was a recruit, so she could sneak away to practice her music. Unlike many of the recruits, she had been chosen to become a dragon master rather quickly 
making her the youngest of six dragon masters remaining in Dragon Hall. There had been eight, but after the two recent tragedies, with their senior and most experienced dragon master being found dead, and Nora Frey being exiled, there were only six left. While Irene was the youngest of the Glendon Dragon Riders, she was perhaps the most famous. She had called in a young speckled gray feral fledgling at this very spot. Melody was its name. Melody was a very beautiful, very curious, and very bright dragon, and after a few treats, quickly became quite friendly and very protective. Unwilling to be trained or answer to anyone else, Irene was quickly promoted after serving less than a year as a recruit. Many years later, her story had become a bit of a legend, and Irene was affectionately known as the Dragon Whisperer, or Dragon Soother. Most dragons liked music, but Melody loved music, and would fall asleep right in her lap. At least that was when she was small. Now, Melody was too big for that. Unfortunately, after the recent tragedies, Irene had not been able to take Melody out flying. She missed going out alone and playing her harp inside the secluded deep blue chambers hidden away in the mountain glaciers. As much as she wanted to be with Melody now, Irene did not want her dragon to catch on to the sense of dread and fear that gnawed at her insides. Instead, she focused on the ocean and took in a deep breath and exhaled, letting go of the nightmares, the nightmare of losing Melody, losing Melody like Nora had lost golden eyes to the giant bull drake that circled overhead, constantly looking for a way to get at their colony. Everyone was torn about how to handle the bull drake, Magi Cora, Simmons, and Master Torrin were eager to kill it. But Master Warren and Magi Solston were convinced there was another way. They just needed time to think of something, but time was running out. As much as Irene was frightened for her melody, she could not bring herself to kill the great bull drake. She wanted a chance to at least try to call it in, to try and tame it. Killing the bull drake would be absolutely meaningless. Cora, who had been close friends with Nora Frey, was out for revenge, and every problem to Torn was an ugly nail sticking out of a board that either needed to be smashed or ripped out. Simmons was afraid, afraid like everyone else. Irene was afraid too, but she couldn't see the benefit of killing such a beautiful creature. She hadn't come to Dragon Hall to kill dragons, neither had Simmons. Simmons just believed that killing this one would save the others from being harmed, but Irene felt differently. Killing this one would only mean they would be precisely where they were. But if she could call it in and tame it, they would actually be making progress. But the feral bull drake was massive, and no one had ever called one in that big or old before. Well, at least, not tamed it after. But no recruit had ever called a, and tamed a young feral fledgling with a harp before either. At least, not in Glendon and certainly not in living memory. There were stories, but that was all. There were stories of rainbows and pots of gold waiting on the other side as well. Those stories were not true. She and Melody had checked many times. Irene let out a long pent-up breath, but just as she felt the tension of her harp strings, but she winced when she heard the horrid twang, but it was not from her harp. 
It was from the rocky outcropping below. Without moving, her jade green eyes peered downward. It was a recruit. A large youth with a sturdy frame and smiling boyish face. Irene was about to scold him for being lazy and sneaking off when she saw him pull out a simple hand-carved wooden lyre from the nook that she had not yet discovered. Irene's story of calling a feral fledgling out of the clear blue sky and being chosen within the year was one and a billion. There had been some recruits by chance who had found eggs or a hatchling in an abandoned nest while out mountain climbing. But there were many more stories of recruits falling and or being thrown off the ledge by angry mother dragons and or hatchlings growing too large and eating them later. Regardless, recruits still tried. Irene could not fault anyone for trying as much as she wanted to yell at the young recruit, she felt a smile crease her lips as he began to tune the strings of his instrument. Irene plucked a chord, and the soothing rich note sang out, causing the young recruit to gasp in dismay as he turned to look up at her. Master Irene, I was, I was, um, I, I, he began. Your lyre is out of tune. Irene remarked coldly. He nodded. Irene extended her hand, and he reluctantly gave it up to her. What's your name, recruit? she inquired. My name is Brumir, he confessed, clearly worried whether she was going to return his instrument and dreading as to what sort of punishment he would receive for skipping out on his duties. If Nora had caught him, she would have smashed the liar on the rocks, right in front of him, and told him to get back to work. That's if she was feeling charitable. Irene had seen her recruits flogged for taking a few biscuits from Chow Hall instead. Irene fished out the middle tuning fork from her tunic and struck it. The twin prongs hummed as they were placed upon the wooden uh, sound box until finally, with careful and precise adjustments, the layer strings melted together into an enchanted stream of rich, colorful tones. Brumir gulped as he accepted the, the layer back. It wasn't tuned the way he would have done it, but... The chords melted together so wonderfully that he wouldn't have wanted them to be any other way ever again. Do you often come here to shirk your duties? Irene inquired. Brumer grimaced. I wasn't shirking exactly. I was um just letting the fire settle down for a bit and getting some fresh air, he explained. I see. Is that your wooden box? And the rocks as well, Irene inquired. Brumer's eyes went big, but he quickly shook his head. I, I don't know whose those belong to. Irene's stern frown deepened. I think you do. Somebody has been drawing up here while they should have been working. And I want to know who it is right now, she insisted coldly. Brumer's boy's face hardened. I will take my lashings, but I won't rat out my friends, he insisted stubbornly. Irene quirked a brow. She wasn't entirely sure what to do next. Everyone else would have been blubbering and telling her whatever she wanted to hear. At least, if she were Nora, they would. Maybe she was too soft. Are you going to play or not, she demanded and glanced down at the wooden box, and then at the harp in his hands. Simple, yet wonderful care and craftsmanship. Whoever had done so had carved them both, but had he drawn those pictures? She couldn't be sure. 
Boomer grinned as he gently felt the stringers hum beneath his fingers. I uh, should probably be getting back to work, he remarked and then paused. Will you be here again? he asked curiously. Irene did not respond, but the subtle, soft, secret smile on her lips told him all he needed to know before he darted off. The soft muted roar of the deep blue white capped waves resonated from down below the ancient caverns cut out high within the rocks. The caverns had been home to dragons for millions of years, but the cut stone had been carved out and embellished by the mages within the recent centuries. Yet even now, the cavern still resonated with the deep rumbling, throaty thrums, threshing of wings, and the clack of talons. The Hall of Dragons was truly a special place. Anyone could request to join. While it wasn't necessary to be a mage, the recruits still had to be good with dragons. Or rather, the dragons had to get along with the recruits. Being a gifted mage, or a great, strong, strapping warrior, helped. But there was not much strength, sword, or magic could do for anyone after a fall from 10,000 feet into some chasm hundreds of miles away from civilization. Dragons were as unique and peculiar as they were dangerous, yet having air superiority over the nation's enemies was worth both the risk and all the expenses that came with housing them. While anyone could apply to be part of Dragon Hall, the actual selection process, from a humble stable hand to being outfitted and designated with the title as Dragon Rider, was often long and grueling. Most recruits either got discouraged, quit, got killed, or went missing. Dragons were nothing like the friendly creatures of silly children's books. To become a dragon rider took years of back-breaking labor before getting a fledgling to train or inheriting one from a rider that had either retired, been killed, maimed, or simply went missing. Ben didn't mind spending time with the dragons. He was so fascinated by them. While they weren't cuddly or bastions of wisdom, they weren't monsters either. They were dragons. But after serving two years in Dragon Hall as a stable boy, a janitor, and boot shiner, he missed home, and he missed his friends and family. One more day. Ben yawned as he rolled out of the top bunk and rubbed the short, stubbly, shaven head as he stumbled towards the wash basin. When he looked up, his longtime bunkmate and friend was busily emptying out the small nightstand. I'm leaving, Ben, Jason declared. What do you mean? We'll be getting leave in two weeks, Ben exclaimed in shock. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of everything, Jason growled. I'm going to grow my, out my hair. I want to go back out into town. I'm tired of living like some damned minimalist monk, he growled. Ben grimaced. Everything Jason had said was true. Being a stable hand was worse than being a first-year mage in training at Founder's Keep. All their friends who had graduated were living the good life after they had chosen their respective guilds. But Jason wasn't that easily discouraged. Ben had never thought of him being so materialistic. He had stuck with him through thin and thick. What do you mean? I know that. We all knew that coming in. What happened? he asked. I saw the list, Jason confessed. 
Hot, angry tears were running down his face. A concerned line formed over Ben's forehead. He and Jason had joined Dragon Hall together. It's been two years, and there are a hundred in front of us, he declared. Ben swallowed hard. But that's all right. Th things happen. Maybe we'll be called in to capture a nuisance fledgling from a farm in t in, or in town. Maybe a, a clutch of eggs will be hatched this year or next, he encouraged him. Or maybe a, a rider will retire and go missing or die, Jason grunted. Ben grimaced. He hadn't wanted to bring that up. It was true, though. That was the only other way of getting a dragon, but it wasn't something he ever wanted to wish on anyone. Thomas has been waiting ten years, and he isn't even on top ten, Jason added, and let out another agonized, heavy sigh. Folded his shirt into his suitcase and shut the lid. Think of it this way, Ben. I figure I'm doing you a favor. With me gone, you'll, you'll rise up faster. Ben was silent as his friend pressed a small glass jar full of acorn-sized, polished gray merit stones. Put these toward your leave time, he added. Ben felt a sharp pain well up in his chest. It was the pain of losing a friend and gratitude of his last act of generosity before going. It had been two years since Ben had seen his family, and he needed at least twenty stones to take leave. Of course, the merit stone could only be used after two years, which meant he would soon be able to apply. Unable to delay much longer, Ben went his way. The breakfast hall buzzed and bumbled with row upon row of fuzzy shaved heads. There were so many recruits, all eager, all striving, all hoping to one day possibly be able to ride a dragon or even just be allowed to work with them. Dragons needed an extensive infrastructure and required a large number of resources to be kept happy. There needed to be a kitchen workers, janitors, livestock keepers, security, stable masters, and of course, the dragons, and the dragon riders themselves. The hall was its own little micro-city unto itself. But right now, he felt alone in the large beehive. It was then a familiar voice called out his name. Ben turned. It was nearly impossible to find who had called out to him amongst the bland morning faces and shaved heads. Ben! She called again. He turned and was stunned by her embrace. Ben froze and blinked rapidly. It took a moment for him to recognize her. Her deep sapphire blue eyes, her cute freckles and strange offset toothy smile sparked a distant memory. It was either May or was it Tori? May? He ventured to guess. May had been a novice mage two years behind him before he had graduated. May's eyes lit up and she quickly nodded. You remember me! I'm so happy! She exclaimed. Ben smiled. How, how did you recognize me? It's been so long. I don't think even my own mother would recognize me now, he laughed. May sighed. She did miss those dark, thick curls, but his shaven head didn't make his neck and shoulders more pronounced. Well, <laughs> you, you just sort of have the very unique shaped head, she giggled. And nobody else has ears like you do, she added. Ben felt his face go red. As she reached up and touched his ears that had been mangled from boxing. Oh, 
Lots of people have busted ears, he huffed. <laughs> Lots of mage guards, but not very many mages, she teased him. Ben grimaced and quickly pushed her hands away. Where's Jason? May inquired. Ben's shoulders drooped. He, he, he left this morning, he sighed. Oh, he got chosen. That's wonderful. You are probably going to be picked next, May gasped excitedly. Ben shook his head. No, he's going back to Founder's Keep to continue his studies as a mage, he clarified. May's smile faded. It slowly began to register. But that's, that's what he always wanted, to be a dragon rider, she gasped. Ben grimaced. Yeah, I know. This isn't like the books, May. It's taken me two years of scraping to even be a stable master, just to be able to see the dragons up close on the regular and have the privilege to shine the dragon master's boots and shovel their dragon dung. It might be years, maybe even decades before I'm assigned to a dragon, and even longer before it's even old enough to carry passengers. I might not actually even get to fly. I might do all the training and then keel over from old age and some other recruit will hop in and take my place, he grunted. But May wasn't discouraged in the slightest. Oh, can you take me there? Take me to see to the stables to see them? To, to see them up close, she pleaded. Ben felt his heart pound beneath May's soft, gentle fingers as they rested upon his collarbone. Ben opened his mouth to say no. Okay, he heard himself say. His face burned as she planted a hot kiss onto his cheek. Mwah! When? Ben's dark, mahogany brown eyes darted back and forth like a cuckoo clock being wound up and recalibrated. Um, uh, while well, everyone is at lunch, he said quickly. May beamed happily. I'll save some breakfast biscuits. Ben's eyes went wide with panic, and he quickly pulled her close. No! No, you can't feed them, he insisted in a firm, hushed whisper. I meant for us. We'll be skipping lunch, May teased, as she tugged playfully at his worn-out gray shirt. No food. Not one crumb. Not anything. Don't wear anything flashy. No jewelry. No hats. No buttons. May scrunched her nose. Buttons? Will they nibble them off like goats? She remarked in surprise. She had been to a petting zoo once, when she was six, and she had found that out the hard way. Ben sighed. Let's put it this way. Dragons don't nibble. So you can look, but that's all. Then we we'll leave, and we never tell anybody about it, all right? He insisted. May nodded her head in agreement. Have you attempted a telepathic link with them? She asked curiously. Ben grit his teeth as May's voice bombarded into his head like a noisy one-man band beating a drum and blowing horns and bashing cymbals. Seeing his expression, May quickly apologized. Sorry, I, I forgot you, how much you don't like telepathy. It gives me the shivers. Don't do that again, he grunted. May smiled apologetically. I promise, she assured him. I meant it, May, Ben insisted sternly. May frowned. Why are you so uptight? I said I wouldn't. It's not like I'm using forbidden magic, she insisted. Ben wasn't swayed. It's bloody damn close. and It gives me the creeps, he grunted. Ben, she gasped and shocked and, and offended that he would even imply such a heinous thing. Telepathy isn't at all the same as necromancy, she insisted. It's close enough, Ben insisted darkly. Necromancers don't ask permission or care if anyone else is home. Telepathy is just the first step. May frowned. She didn't like th to think of such things. The thought of studying the dark arts... Hadn't even crossed her mind. For someone that hates it so much, you seem to know an awfully lot about it, she shot back defensively. 
I didn't learn it studying necromancy. I learned it studying the drone, and they're quite proficient in it, he warned. May better lower lip. The Marne and the Droon have been at war for decades. Supposedly, Marne and Droon had been one country until the divide. Ben still had family over on the other side and often spoke about them. May didn't believe another group of people could be so horrible. But ben made them sound like monsters. But she sensed the tangible anger and dread resonating in his voice. And if she was ever going to see the dragons up close, she knew this wasn't going to be a good time to debate with him. I won't do it any more, she assured him, and gave him a reassuring touch on the shoulder before heading off to finish her assignments. Chapter 7 Who is Molly? May grinned when she spotted Ben standing by the archway. Instead of getting into... The lunch line and grabbing a food tray, she bounded after him. Are you sure you aren't hungry? she asked wordly. Ben smiled and shook his head, but his stomach growled loudly in protest. What happens if we're caught? May asked. Ben grunted as he led the way through the winding stone hallways. Just a tongue lashing and you'll lose a few merit stones. But you won't be able to take a leave for a few years anyway, he shrugged. Ben! She, May gasped. Ben paused and glanced tiredly down at May. You haven't seen your family in two years? She gasped with shock. Ben grimaced. I write letters. It doesn't matter. Jason gave me his, so... I have a few to burn anyway, he chuckled. May saw him laugh. But she felt the tired sadness in it. Are you sure? she asked. Ben nodded and then brightened up. We'll be fine. Just uh, don't pull a Molly on me, all right? He chuckled. May frowned. Who's Molly? she asked. Don't you remember Molly f from Founders? Oh, her, May scowled. She was a snood. Nobody likes her, she huffed. Secretly, she was frightened Molly would steal Ben away while they were gone. What did she do? she asked curiously. Ben took in a deep breath before giving the short, tragic story of Molly. Well, apparently, when no one was around, she climbed into the dragon pin. And one thing led to another. It took us three days to figure out she was missing. May suddenly felt guilty. She had hoped something bad would befall Molly. Maybe something like lice or poison ivy. But not that. Nothing like that at all. Oh, Ben, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to be cr so crass. Were you too close? She asked worriedly. Ben shook his head. Molly came to the hall a year ahead of me, so we didn't spend much time together. I just remember everyone getting a long lecture about not throwing off the dragon's feeding schedule and how overfeeding them would make them sluggish and increase the cost to sustain them. We all assumed she had snuck off to town or went back home. We didn't know what really happened to Molly until we found a shoe while freshening up the stables, he explained. So yeah, now you know the legend of Molly. May smiled and gave a nod. Irene had mentioned Molly to her, but she hadn't been brave enough to ask about it before. All right, so the dragons are kept in here. Just don't make any sudden movements or wave anything about and stay close, he instructed. May sighed. Don't worry, Ben, you know me. I'm not a total idiot. I won't climb in or try to pet them, she promised. With a nod, Ben unbolted the door and they were greeted by the sound of a low, rumbling thrums and threshing of wings that resonated within the white-washed walls. At the bottom of the stairs, their feet sank into the soft ashes. Is this all from the dragons? May asked. Ben shook his head. Oh no, we bring in fresh ashes every week. The dragons use it for dust bass, he explained. 
may already knew this, feral dragons like to bathe in ash as well, but it made sense to supply the ashes before the dragon tried to make their own. How many fire breathers do you have, she asked. Only three are old enough right now, but we keep the ashes out so we don't have any su sudden surprises before we are ready. A long head with shimmering jade scales curiously peeked over the stone barrier and greeted Ben with a soft, throaty thrum. This is Hatter's, Ben announced as he stroked her scaly head. May gasped as Ben invited her over to meet the young female dragon. Hatter's, you're so lovely. I love your new scales. Have you shed recently? She cooed softly and then smiled toward Ben. Her scales are so soft, she hasn't even gotten her horns yet, she marveled. Ben grinned. He knew there was a reason why he liked May. All the regrets of missing lunch and worries about taking her to see the dragons quickly melted away. Seeing May's sense of wonder and awe as she interacted with Hatters re-energized him, and all thoughts of despair and leaving the hall now felt like a distant memory. With the May around, he was pretty sure he could be t contented, stationed in the cold northern waste with only salted gruel every day. It was so good to see her again. Ben stepped back and smiled as Hatter's bright orange eyes rolled to the back of his head and thrummed happily. The happy thrumming quickly got the attention as several more dragons poked their heads out over the high walls and craned their long necks to see what the other dragon was getting that they weren't. Ben, why does it say Jade on her stall? May asked curiously. Ben grimaced. Well, that's her name, but no one calls her that anymore, he chuckled. Hatters isn't a very nice dragon name. Why do they call you such horrible th names, May cooed softly. Hatters thrummed happily before raising its head and ducked behind the stalls. May gasped as it lifted up a mangled goat and violently thrashed it around. The sounds of bone and joints snapping echoed throughout the stables. She likes hats. That's why, Ben chuckled, but then put his hand on her shoulder and gave her a stern warning. But seriously, don't ever walk in here with a hat on, or you'll wind up like that goat. Or Molly, May remarked. Or Molly, he agreed. May took in a deep, shaky breath as she stepped away. But Ben put his hand up and stopped her as she carefully guided her away from the stall behind her. You don't want to get close to that stall. He is our bull drake. He can be a bit grouchy, he warned. Uh, they've been talking about moving him off to a different colony in another province. We have been having trouble keeping him apart from Rex, our senior bull drake. He's the big, gray, crabby face over there with the full crown and black speckles, he explained. May sighed. Poor Prince, you are so shy, she cooed. Ben grimaced. Not exactly, just keep away from the stall, all right, he instructed. May nodded, and they continued down the row of stables, where Ben introduced her to Luna, a shy, bronze hendrake, and Melody was a bright-eyed, bubbly, gray hendrake. I always thought they would be bigger, she mused out loud. It was true. Ben remembered his first time. Dragons always seemed bigger in his mind. If only measuring from the shoulder, a Clydesdale horse stood taller, but with a dragon's long, swan-like neck more than made up for its powerful short legs. They can get quite compact when they're settled down and their wings are folded. Just keep on your toes. All that can change real fast, he cautioned. 
But it's not their talons or their teeth that'll get you. It's their tail, he added. All the books say that, May giggled. Well, it's true. I lost five shovels to them, he chuckled. Their tails are dexterous, May remarked in surprise. Ben nodded. Yeah, they'll steal whatever is not let tied down, he laughed. May sighed. That's not what I meant. I meant that their tails can grab things like monkey tails, she corrected him. Ben grinned. Oh, yeah, that too, he chuckled. How do you keep them from getting out of the stables, May asked. Well, that's easy. I'll show you, Ben declared as they went over to demonstrate on an empty stall. Oh, wow. It looks more like a bank vault than a door, May marveled. Ben nodded. Yeah, it's pretty sophisticated. We have to come up with something that doesn't involve keys, he chuckled. I'm surprised there's only four cylinders. I would have suspected the dragons would have been able to figure out something so simple, May remarked. Ben shook his head. Dragons are smart, but I haven't heard of the, any of them being that smart, he assured her, and then frowned. That's strange. What is? May asked. It's, um, unlocked already. Just as he closed the stall door and locked it again, another door opened. Ben felt his blood go cold. May gasped and quickly moved close to him. Ben turned and his throat went dry when he saw the very moody prince strut out into the open and flex his powerful black wings. The soft, calm thrums turned to excited, fluted chortles, followed by the loud rumbling roar from Rex on the other end of the stables. What do we do? May whispered. Ben gulped as he slowly guided her back toward the door. Don't panic and don't run, he whispered. Aren't you going to put him back? May exclaimed. Not by myself, I'm not. Ben scoffed. I could help. I'm a mage like you, remember, she insisted. Ben swallowed hard. All right. Just stay calm. No sudden movements. Fast movements will trigger his prey reflex, he warned. Yes, but what do I do? May hissed impatiently. Close the door when I say. I can do more than just that, May insisted. Help me with the small things, and I'll trust you with the bigger things, he insisted as he picked up a shovel. The square iron head began to glow bright yellow. May bit her lip and gave a grim nod as she calmly maneuvered toward the door while Ben attempted to break up the two bull drakes. The young bulldrake spun around, its fierce blue eyes locked onto the glowing red shovel. Immediately, his grievances with Rex were forgotten as he swayed his head rhythmically with the gentle motion of the shovel. The sharp claws rasped across the floor as Prince let out an excited, chortling click of his tongue and slowly lumbered toward Ben. Ben tossed the shovel into Prince's stall. The young Boldrig glanced at the shovel and watched the hot metal fade back to black with mild interest and then turned his large head and cocked it to the side. The floor shook and the walls rattled as the dragon cracked its tail through the air and lashed the floor churning up a big, sooty cloud of ash. Hello, sweet prince, May cooed. Ben's eyes widened in panic, but it was too late. The young bull drake's attention quickly turned toward May. You're so smart. Look at you, she cooed. Prince reared up on his haunches and flexed his massive black sails that spanned the whole length of the large room. May, he exclaimed in panic, but he could not reach her. All he could see was the shadowy outline of her murky silhouette through the thin, segmented, spidery web curtain of membrane that was cast by the lantern light. Ben ducked. 
He felt the sound wave and heard the bone-chilling whiz crack as the prince's tail cut through the air, crushing the metal lantern on the wall. The light vanished. May vanished. May, he called again. Above the rhythmic, slow, steady, rumbling growl, he heard her soft, gentle voice. She was still alive. Your wings are so big and beautiful, May called out to the dragon in a soft, sing-song voice. Don't go in there. You'll be trapped, Ben pleaded. But May was already slowly backing into the dragon's stall. Does your poor head hurt? May cooed softly. To Ben's surprise, Prince let out a mournful, howling thrum as he sat down on all fours large hot tears ran down his face as he lowers its head may gave him a soothing shushing sound as she reached up stroking the, around the bull drake's thorny forehead ben watched helplessly as he held his breath as may quietly led him into the stall ben held his breath he knew just one wrong move on his part would get them both torn to shreds. It was all up to May now. Or rather, it was all up to Prince. One wrong move, and they'd be just another statistic in a safety briefing. After what seemed like the longest five minutes in his life, May slowly got up and walked out of the dragon stall. Ben let out a ragged breath. Prince was curled up on the floor in a deep, restful sleep. Once the door was shut, Ben turned to May. May smiled back at him. His head was hurting, and he didn't get to go flying today. And Rex did, she explained. Oh, wait, how do you know that? He gasped in wonder. He told me, May giggled. Ben frowned. They can't talk, he huffed. Not like us, no. No, it's more like pictures and smells and things. It's it's really complicated. They think and see things completely different than we do, May explained. A lot of it's gibberish. Well, it would be for us, but I think it would, would mean something to them, she mused out loud. May, that is so dangerous. Don't ever do that again, he pleaded. He engaged me first. It would have been rude not to respond, she insisted. Ben grunted. Just don't do that so much. You're just lucky Master Simmons is a telepath as well. Not all dragons like that, you know, he insisted. Like you, May giggled. Yeah, but I won't eat you, May smiled over toward him. You wear your feelings on your sleeves. I don't need to read your thoughts, she teased him. Ben glowered at her. I suppose you'll know what I'm going to say next, he grunted. You were scared? I was too, and I'm glad you're all right, May assured him. Ben's hands unclenched and his shoulders relaxed. <sighs> I suppose the tour is over, May sighed. Ben gave a sheepish shrug. Would you like to see the gear room? He suggested. May's eyes lit up, and she quickly nodded. Ben grinned and led her out of the stables into a side hall. Take off your shoes. It helps keep the ash and dust being dragged all over the place, he instructed. The gear room was immaculate. It was brightly lit with candles and full of colorful tapestries. Along the, the walls were private stations where each Dragon Master had their gear polished and set out on wooden armor stands. I thought they would be more colorful, May remarked, her voice slightly disappointed. Ben shook his head. No, they have been specifically lacquered with dull mad colors. The last thing they want is for their dragons to be intensely fixated on whatever they're wearing. May giggled. You mean like hatters? She laughed. It must be terribly cold up there. What does her master do when they are out flying? She asked. Ben grinned. Well, it's sort of tricky. 
Master Solson has the helmet and goggles sort of smuggled into the saddlebag while she isn't looking, and he puts them on during flight and stows them back away before dismounting, he explained. Most dragons grow out of it, but not her. I don't know why, Ben shrugged. It's because a boy used to throw rocks at her when she was a hatchling, May explained. Ben frowned and gave May a look of disapproval. Hatters was caught stealing chickens and ate the farm boy's dog. The poor kid was bawling his eyes out. Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's horrible. I had no idea, she gasped. They aren't sweet, innocent doves, May. Please don't do that anymore. You might get hurt, he insisted. May offered a sheepish grin. I haven't done it since you told me not to, she giggled. Ben let out a frustrated grunt. Just be careful. Not everyone likes their heads being cracked open like eggs, he grumbled. I didn't crack her head open. She happily shared it with me when I asked, May giggled. Ben sighed. He supposed he couldn't argue with success. Still, all the dragon masters cautioned against it, even Master Simmons, and he was a telepath. Then again, the dragon masters did a lot of things that they said not to do. You know, May commented, I'm surprised that they don't use scales. I heard of other riders wearing dragon scales. Ben nodded. Some colonies they do, but Master Don Ruskell didn't approve of it. Everyone here regarded him so highly they followed his example. He pointed out and grinned as he showed her the dark maroon studded of their harness. While the armor wasn't very colorful, May couldn't help but admire the black pyramid-shaped metal studs that flowed in a near-seamless pattern on the outside. Or at least she tried to admire it, as Ben seemed to be very excited about it. That brigading set on the rack belongs to Magi Simmons. You can tell because he is so tall and spindly, he pointed out. Brigandini? May asked. Brigandine, Ben corrected her. Every diamond stud represents a small interlocked metal plate riveted between the fabric. Sort of like uh, scales or roofing tiles underneath. It's a lot easier to get on than full plate harness and a lot more flexible, he explained. But why did they stop wearing a scale, she asked. She had always romanticized about having her own set of dragon scale armor. She remembered all those fancy parties as a child and the wealthy guests sporting their scaled purses, earrings, and suits, and armor. That was before such things were made illegal to wear out in public, as there was no telling how they had been acquired. Some may have been shed naturally, others not so much. No one has ever spoken about Master Riskrell. Will I get a chance to beat him? May asked. Ben shook his head. No, he, uh... He died. There's a small shrine up top on the lookout tower, he replied. May was surprised to see Ben quickly brush away a tear. Did you know him well? she asked. Ben grunted and gave a shrug. Everyone knew old man Ruskell. I mean, everyone that's been around for a while. He was tough on everybody, but fair, I suppose, he sighed. Hoping to cheer Ben up, May quickly changed topics. I do like this helmet, she marveled. It's very unique. The wings remind me of something like a Valkyrie might wear. May glanced back. Ben suddenly seemed withdrawn. What's wrong? she asked. Ben shrugged and let out another heavy sigh. That was Magi Frey's helmet, he replied. Oh no, what happened? Did she die too? she gasped. Ben shook his head. Not exactly. You remember the empty stall? he asked. May nodded. While flying, she was attacked by a feral bull drake, and her dragon was killed, he explained. <gasps> May clapped her hands over her mouth, her eyes wide with shock and horror. Oh no! You mean Norfrey? That's horrible! I heard w w about that in Founders. She was a proper mage just like us, she exclaimed in horror. 
You know about her? Ben remarked in surprise. May nodded. Mender's Hall is livid. They wanted to see her, her to be executed after what she had done by ordering them to heal our dragon. Ben nodded. Yeah, well, she was sent away up north. No one has ever seen her since. For a long moment, none of them said anything until Ben pointed out toward the goggles. They use different colored lenses depending on the weather and light, he pointed out. May marveled at the multi-colored glass goggles. She was about to touch one, but Ben quickly intercepted her hand. They are very, very expensive. I would be flogged if there were any sort of fingerprints or smudges on them, he warned. May quickly shoved her hands into her pockets. Ben smiled and shook his head. No worries. Come on. No more sad stories. Let's get a move on. Maybe we can see if there's any food left over from, from lunch. May smiled and quickly nodded in agreement when the door swung open. A tall, spindly man with a goatee and long, black overcoat blocked their path. What are you two doing in here? he demanded. A pleasure to finally meet you, Magi Simmons, she said hurriedly. Magi Simmons blinked. Ben, what's going on? Who is this new recruit? Why have you brought her here? he demanded. Uh, we were looking for you, he said quickly. Magi Simmons paused. Me, he said. Uh, Prince stole my shovel again, and I thought May might be able to ask him to give it back. May's a mage and a telepath like you. I thought Prince would listen, but he didn't, so we came looking for you, Ben explained. The sternness in Simmons' face faded away, and he straightened up. Oh, he stole it again, did he? Well... Is it still in one place? Or has he chewed it all to hell? Ben gave a sheepish shrug. I don't know. We aren't supposed to go inside. Prince was very chatty. His head was hurting, and he is upset that he didn't get to go flying this morning, May added. Simmons grinned a big toothy grin, and his fingers rasped loudly across the thick black goatee like he was cresting the bristles of a wire brush. They have been pretty moody lately. They haven't gotten enough exercise since that big feral bull drake has been coming around, he sighed. And Prince is at that stage. I'm glad you weren't hurt getting him back into his stables, he added. Both May and Ben's faces turned to sheets of white as they braced themselves for the stern tongue lashing to follow. Simmons glared down at Ben. He said nothing. Ben lowered his head in shame. I'm sorry, I... he began. Wanted to impress your mate, Simmons clarified. Ben's face w was beet red. He wanted to say they were just friends or, or something, but anything he could think of responding would only dig himself into a deeper hole. Yes, he admitted. To his surprise... Simmons punched him hard on the shoulder and laughed. <laughs> I'm not angry. I should be, but I'm not, he laughed. <laughs> Is that what Prince thinks we are? Ben blinked and stared up at Simmons in surprise. You you aren't mad? Simmons shook his head. <laughs> not at all. Turns out someone has been fiddling with the locks. Lucky it was only you two down there when he was let out. Anybody else would have been torn to pieces, he explained. Who would do that? Ben gasped. Somebody who wanted to shorten the list is my guess, Simmons remarked grimly. It has happened every night, so I know it was not your friend, and I doubt you would be stupid enough to bring her into the stables while all the doors were unlocked, he grunted. I have my suspicions. I just can't prove them yet. Talking to... Talking to dragons is sort of like talking to a raven. They have totally different priorities than we do, he grunted. Prince talked about you a lot, May giggled. Simmons grunted. Don't get too overconfident. Not all dragons like mages. Or magic, he warned. Not all these dragons have 
been hatched in the lap of luxury. Some have been taken as fledglings, and they tend to have a few odd hang-ups, he warned. Like hatters, May, he remarked. Master Simmons nodded. So you know about hatters as well? Yes, I suppose. She doesn't like hats. Some dragons don't like mages for that same reason, he cautioned. But why, May asked. If a mage killed your mother, you wouldn't like mages either, Simmons shrugged. But who would do that, May gasped. Mages that don't share our values, sometimes dead dragons, are much easier to control, Simmons explained. Necromancy, that's that's barbaric, she gasped. The very thought of, of it was wretched and twisted her stomach into knots. It is what it is, Simmons sighed. But who is leaving the doors unlocked, Ben asked. If May wasn't there, I would have been the one ripped to pieces. Simmons shook his head. Let's put it this way. If you hadn't introduced May, she would have been the one torn limb from limb, he warned. But Prince, he was on to me. He wasn't having any of it, Ben insisted. Simmons smiled. Right now, Prince is a cantankerous toad. He was just trying to show off. See if he would flinch. Next time, punch him in the nose and he'll back off, he advised. Ben blinked. He knew dragons had sensitive snouts, but he had never imagined himself ever being brave enough to punch something that had teeth as big as bananas. May's eyes went big. Why would you do that? she exclaimed. <laughs> Simmons laughed. Because he's an honorary snood, and he needs it. Dragons don't think like we do. Affection and respect for a dragon sometimes means a good rap on the nose, he chuckled. May frowned. Seems to be a bit cruel, she muttered. Sometimes love is pain, and sometimes coddling is cruelty. They aren't human. They aren't dogs. They aren't horses. They are dragons. And if you want their respect... And stay in good one piece. The sooner you learn that, the better you'll be, he cautioned. But what about the bastards that let the dragons loose, Ben insisted. Simmons put up a finger and tapped his large hawk-like nose. I have devised a plan, he declared. Ben and May grinned. I'm putting you on night watch, Simmons announced. Ben groaned. Then what? May asked excitedly. Simmons arched a rueful brow. You're getting a bit ambitious for your first day. For now, you will do nothing with time. And if you work hard at the small tasks, I will put more responsibility onto you. For now, this is Ben's assignment. Besides, only senior recruits are trusted with night patrol after curfew. May's excited grin faded away, and she lowered her gaze to the floor, disappointedly as Master Simmons turned back to Ben. Do not engage anyone. Just see what you can find and report back to me in the morning. Let me know if anything funny happens, Simmons instructed. Ben grinned. So do I get the rest of the day off, he asked. Simmons didn't smile back. His voice became stern and hard. Don't see this as punishment, but a path to redeem yourself, he advised. Uh, when I find him, I'm going to wring his neck, Ben growled. Keep this between us, and I will see you are well compensated Perhaps even some leave time, Simmons assured him. Ben's eyes lit up. But just then he paused and glanced over to May. She was smiling back at him. And then he realized he didn't want to go. He didn't want to leave her. Even if it meant shoveling pig slop or sharing a bowl of gruel. Simmons smirked. I tell you what. If you find this troublemaker and bring him in, I'll take you both flying whenever this troublesome bulldrake clears off, he offered. 
Ben gave a sharp salute. I won't let you down, Master Simmons, he promised. Good to hear. If you two stick with it, I see a bright future for the both of you in Dragon Hall, he encouraged them, and then his voice changed into a low, sinister whisper. Now, this is where I start yelling, and you two run off and act like you've had a stern tongue lashing. He winked before suddenly starting shouting at the top of his lungs. If I catch you two kissing in this room again, I'll feed your maggot-ridden hides to the dragons, he bellowed. Ben and May squawked in panic, and they grabbed their shoes and bolted out the door. They blushed as judgmental stares were cast toward them by their peers, until finally they found a quiet corner where they were alone again. I've got to go mop the hallways and clean the retreats, May sighed. Ben gulped. I gotta go to the burn pits and uh, load up fresh ash. He lamented. Are you going to let go of my hand? May asked. He blinked. Oh, um, May landed a kiss onto his lips and darted off. Ben felt his ears blaze red as he ambled awkwardly off in the opposite direction. You lost, Ben? Milo asked. No, I'm, I'm just frustrated is all, he grumbled. Milo grinned a big grin. Must be nice, he chuckled. So was it worth the extra duty on night shift? Ben let out a flustered sigh as he put a shovel into a wheelbarrow. Can you keep a secret, Milo? he asked. Milo shook his head. No, I prefer spreading gossip and rumors about like an old ninny. Why? he asked. Forget it, Ben growled. He was already missing Jason. Milo was still fairly new and had a bad habit of being overly cheerful about everything. Come on, Ben, you can tell me, he insisted. No way, you'll tell everybody, Ben scoffed. Oh, I would too, Milo agreed. Ben paused and smiled. You know something? That's it. Can you spread a rumor for me, he asked. Who do you think I am? Milo scoffed. What do you got? Hmm, I heard there's a new batch of hatchlings coming in, Ben announced. That's it? Milo coughed as he shoveled more ashes into the wheelbarrow. That means there will be tryouts for some new dragon masters, he explained. Milo grinned. That should be interesting. How many do you think? he asked. Oh, Probably two or three, I imagine, Ben shrugged. But um, don't tell anyone that I told you, he insisted sternly. Milo paused, tilted his head to the side, a little perplexed. Ben gave him a wink. Milo grinned. I never heard nothing, he chuckled. Up next, Chapter 8, The Watchtower. Hello, my name is Marco, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm the author and narrator and illustrator and the, uh, the guy with the shaky drone footage. <laughs> um, but I need your help. You see, no name writer, no name artist like me will never have a chance. Uh, and I'll never get published, unless you, unless I have your support, not financial, but that I have your backing, that I know that you are interested, and you can show that with uh, subscribing to the channel and liking the video and your comments. I read all of your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a small channel. I, I treasure the 31 subscribers I have now. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and you're all welcome to the family.
for the next adventure. Is it, uh, the story will continue on with your support. Thank you so much.